Hello and welcome to our 200th episode celebration. Tonight, we record the 200th episode of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. I'm Sean, your host, and here with me live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better for way longer than it feels like at times. <laughs> For those of you who aren't here live, remember, you can always join us Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, since the entire point of tonight is to celebrate hitting an arbitrary numbered milestone of 200, we won't be sticking to our usual format, though you're probably going to get just as much sausage making and mistakes as usual as the way things are going so far. Instead, we're going to be starting off with a special piece of feedback that we want to share with everyone. Then we've got an announcement about a cool update to our show, at least as far as YouTube is concerned. Plus a bit more Sean doesn't even know about. Then Sean and I are going to share our top 25 games of all time, or really our top 25 are right now, but we'll explain that later. Um, because we're always constantly trying new games these days and our tastes change week to week. I still say if I reran the entire thing today, it'd be different than the result I got yesterday. Then I think it'll be time for our big announcement of the night, our 200th episode. Tabletop Game Giveaway, brought to you by a slew of awesome publishers we've worked with over the last 200 shows. Yeah, we have a, a surprising number of sponsors to thank during this, and you are all awesome for supporting this celebration. Now, after that, we're going to spend some time interacting with the awesome folks in our chat who joined us in our lobby tonight. That's our trap room here on Twitch. And honestly, I have no exact idea where that's going to go or how long we'll hang out. But I expect it to be kind of like an informal Q&A or an AMA. Now, somewhere in there, we'll probably talk about the games that got played since last week as well. Now, what we're not going to have is a specific Bellhops tabletop segment where we do talk about the games we played. So I'm assuming it's going to come up. And if it doesn't, I'll just lump them in with next week's. All right. Along with this, though, as a special thank you to those of you who managed to make it tonight, including the Sea Otter, um, here for our live show, we are going to do some giveaways, some door prizes just for tonight. At sem semi random points during the show, we'll ask a tabletop bellhop trivia question based a, a question based specifically on our backlog of 199.5 podcast episodes. The first person to answer one of these questions correctly will get to pick from a selection of prizes. Now, we've stepped up the quality of our door prizes this year and have a mix of board game promos, uh, RPG quick starts, a one sheet from Critical Role, a Flux promo pack, Munchkin promo cards, Root the RPG quick start, some Queenies, Mayfair game promo packs, a book of indie RPGs, and more. Significantly more. And what I just did, for those of you here live, is I dropped a list of door prizes in the chat room which Deanna will update as the night goes on and we'll be crossing out things that have been claimed. And I got to say, this sounds awesome. This will be a lot of fun. So I think what we'll do is we will start with one of those trivia questions right now. A treat for those of you who got here nice and early. Now we're going to start off pretty easy as well. If you are a longtime fan, you probably know the answer to this. Plus, it's pretty easy to Google. Uh, what game did we talk about extensively on the first ever Ask the Bellhop segment of our first ever episode. One mm -hmm. hint, episode zero is not episode one. Oh, our, wow, Roger's already fast. got it. There we go. Yes, Roger. Roger Dodger nailed it. Yep. So Roger Dodger will be the first person to win one of our awesome door prizes. You can, again, you can take a look at the list on the link I dropped in the chat. Deanna will DM you. And we can get your details, which honestly will probably be we'll meet up somewhere in Windsor and we'll hand it to you because <laughs> Roger is an awesome local gamer. Congratulations, Roger. All right. Well, now that that's out of the way, let's get this ball rolling over at the suggestion box. Welcome to the suggestion box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with our listeners, viewers and readers, mostly positive, but sometimes negative. All right, well, well, today we've got a piece of feedback that really meant a lot to us. We thought it would be cool to share with all of you. So a bit of background before we get to the, the, the full email we were sent, or a summary of the email. So back in early January, I was uh, Anna Yoakum reached out to me through the Ask the Bellhop forum on the Bellhop blog with a pretty extensive question. Now, here are some snippets from that original letter. 
So my name is, oh, go ahead. I, we didn't color code this. You can go. <laughs> You're usually better at reading these than I am. So My name is Anna Yoakum, and I am a Girl Scout leader to eight high school age scouts. If that's not a clip, I don't know what else is. <laughs> we are having our second gaming camp out later this month. And I've decided to set it up as a tournament. I was thrilled to find your article about the great Canadian board game blitz because it is exactly what I was looking for. So Anna went on to ask a number of questions about the blitz format and if I know of various resources that could help her. Uh, this included websites, publishers willing to donate games, where to find rule summaries, how to figure out game links, etc. Now, due to the fact this didn't really seem like something that would work as a good full podcast topic, we just emailed each other back and forth. Uh, the big thing I did, of course, was introduce her to Board Game Geek, including some tips on how to navigate it and actually get use out of that site. Because I got to say, for a non-gamer going to that site, it's a bit of a mess, though it is looking better than it ever has. I did find some great geek lists of four player games because she specifically was going to have eight players. So two groups of four is perfect and lists of great tournament games. Now, I also linked a few of our own articles, including games for kids and how to teach games and eventually provided just a list of games I thought would be good for her to use. And then I never heard anything back. That is until mid February, where we got a fantastic reply from Anna, which we're going to summarize right now. Hello. Thank you for your help. I waited until after our game camp out was over to reply so I could give you some feedback. It was a hit. I had to make a couple of modifications, mostly to suit the games and time frame I had available. Also, I had to make sure I found a way for everyone to try the greatest variety of games possible to meet the requirements of a badge. Firstly, I did not have any budget to buy games, and though I have the largest collection of games in the group, but hardcore, hardcore gamer stats, my collection is so small, I needed contributions. <laughs> I sent out an Airtable form, like a Google form, but better for database nerds like me, and asked everyone to submit their games one week before camp so I could work them into a tournament configuration. I gotta say, Airtable actually sounds like a really useful tool. Uh, probably something I'm going to look into myself the next time I'm considering running a Blitz so that I can kind of source some of the local gamers to see what games are available instead of just bringing everything from my own collection. Well, it goes on. Once I had enough of everyone's games, I went through them to see which would work and which wouldn't. I eliminated anything that required knowledge of a specific fandom, Doctor Who, The Simpsons, anything Disney, yeah. and trivia games because some people would have distinct advantages. Fair. Some of the games I was left with don't fit into the scoring model of the Great Canadian Game Blitz, but I thought they could be modified to work. Some games like Can't Stop, I added points to. Three points for completed columns, five points for finishing first, or had players continue to play until the second and third people won. Mm -hmm. This worked very well with Dixit. For long games like Monopoly and Catan, I had players play for a set amount of time until five to ten minutes before the session was over, and had players add up total points rather than playing to a set number of points, which made it easy to find the ranked order for four players. Yeah, that's the hardest part about organizing the Blitz, and I've made that mistake before, where I think of a great four-player game that perfectly fits a one-hour time slot, I bring it to the event, and then the people finish the game, and they go, okay, well, Joe won, what about the rest of us? And I'm like, oh, that's bad. Catan is one of those. So these are some actually really good modifications for the games that were on hand. And I admit I've done similar over the years. So now I'm a little better at trying to make sure the games, because for a proper tournament, you need to have first, second, third, fourth place in every game you play. Well, next, I had to figure out how I wanted to group the games. I ended up with eight themes. Rummy Trick, Humor, Adventure, Deception, Numbers, All the Words, this name is an inside joke, So Many Colors, Snack Time. I also wanted to make sure people tried short games, medium length games and long games. So I added time categories and finished with 11 categories. Wow. I wanted to make sure that the kids tried as many types of games as possible, including length. So I set up the scoring like Yahtzee. A game could count in its theme category or its time category, and you could only play each game for points once. Now, this blew me away. This is a very cool way to do things for a tournament that's spread out over an entire weekend. 
and not like our board game blitz where we have five or six very specific time slots for very specific types of games. Now, Anna did include quite a bit more detail, including sending me copies of the booklet she made for each player to get stamped, the score sheet she modified, and even more, and how she set up a tree for this open-ended system. And I got to say, I was impressed. Now, the scouts got more competitive as the weekend went on. <laughs> and in the last session, they crammed in as many short games as humanly possible. I did award prizes, and those were decided long before. Every year, my family visits an old-timey toy store and I bought four items with this camp out in mind. Jacks, marbles, and game instruction book, pickup sticks, <laughs> and a paddle ball. Not pricey, but unique if you're young. Yeah. Now the first place got to choose two, second place got to pick one, third place got the item that was left. You would think that teenagers with iPhones would turn their noses up at such basic toys, but they loved them. And it was adorable. Now, I like the fact that she included themed prizes, and the prize wasn't just, you know, everyone gets a badge because you participated. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, we did use the Great Canadian Board Game Blitz model of choosing games and game starters. Mm -hmm. I love Schwazi and used it a lot when I was a substitute teacher to avoid bias when selecting students for tasks. By overwhelming consensus, we'll have our third annual gaming camp out in 2024. Nice. Thank you so much for posting the instructions on hosting a Great Canadian Board Game Blitz. And a Yoakum and Troop 70933. See, isn't that awesome? Like, like I just loved reading this email, uh, the full version, which is significantly longer. Like, this just made me feel probably more so than anything else we've done to date as the Tabletop Bellhop with our podcast, that we made a real impact on the world. Like, we, we had a scout group go out and use our format to, to, to earn badges. And then they loved it and they're telling friends and they want to do it next year. Like this, this is why I wanted to share this tonight. Like I've been saving this one up. This is the, this happened back in February. We got the email and I'm like, I don't want to talk about this on a normal show. I want to save it up. We even talked about making a whole podcast episode or a special episode to talk about this. But then I thought, you know what? This will be perfect for the only feedback we'll talk about on our 200th episode. We share comments and feedback like this near the top of every show. Mm -hmm. We love it when you comment on our posts, fire off emails to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or reach out on social media. Now, before we move on to the next segment, I think it's time for another door prize for correctly answering some Bellhop podcast trivia. Now, I'm going to point out now, D is asking if you can leave that up longer anyway, or is it too late to change it now? Nope, too late to change it. Too late to change. Oh, well. We got a nice cool graphic for it. The winner. So the, oh, go ahead. Sorry, <laughs> that's my bad. Talking over each other. See, professional. 200 episodes in and we interrupt each other. The winner will be the first person to correctly, uh, an, or who answers correctly, who we will contact via DM to let you pick a prize and figure out where it's going. All right. I will say Roger has already won. So we, Roger, you're still welcome to answer, though you're probably going to give the answer to someone else, but we're going to limit it to one prize per person tonight. All right. Uh, since starting the show, we have tried a number of different things to see how well they were received. One of these things was to conduct interviews with tabletop game insiders. We did three of these before realizing it just didn't fit in well with our format. No. We are looking for someone to name one of the people who we interviewed. See, I am surprised it just didn't take off. Like, in addition to it, it was awkward. Tom was a disembodied voice, I think, for, <laughs> for two of them. Yeah. Like, he was present, but we couldn't get him on screen. Um, the topics that the guests were talking about was more self-promotional, which is fair. That's why they wanted to come on, and we were cool with that. But it didn't really fit the Ask the Bellhop segment. Now, we have talked about perhaps bringing back an interview format, um, but I, we'd have to do something different. We're right. thinking if we do interviews now, they would be the guest bellhop, right? So we'd find a topic that I don't feel comfortable talking about. So if someone wanted to say, come come out and talk about the trans community and role-playing, we would get a trans person on the show to answer questions instead of myself. That's the way we may do it. Uh, Jeff, that is incorrect. Much as we love Todd, we haven't actually had him on the show. Yeah, no, it's true. Todd wanted to come on when he was doing Pandora. And I was like, you know, we interviewed some other people. <laughs> Yeah, we, Todd, had in, Todd we, had is in the, the, uh, we had him in the chat room, but we didn't have him on the show. I will say Todd Crapper is one degree of separation from one of the people we did interview. 
true. That's true. That is a small hint. Now, <laughs> oh, fair, Ryan. There we yeah, go. I, I, we're not asking anything about colors or shapes or sizes today, so we should be good. Tracy, there we go. Barnett. Biz Matt wins Biz Matt with wins. Tracy Barnett, otherwise known as the other Tracy, who was on to promote Iron Edda. Yes. And I don't remember which version of Iron Edda because he has done four different versions of Iron Edda now. I think Something like that. And you were you were close, Jeff. It's actually oh. Vecchione. Phil Vecchione would have been correct had you gotten that in there. But was not, it in there? Not, not no. He said he oh. wanted to say Vaxion. But it's no, it's Vecchion. Uh, you know, I been... would have given it to you. I would have given it to you, Jeff. Like, you don't need to be able to know how to spell <laughs> Phil's last name. But Bismat wins. Bismat, if you want to check, head over head over to tabletopbellhop.com slash door prizes. We'll drop that link in the chat room for you. You have it. I... And we can check that out go. and ch check the prizes that are available there. And we'll DM. Oh, that's awesome. There's some good stuff in there this time. Deanna, Deanna, usually we give out, like, here's one card. Well, we grouped stuff. There's some good packages this year. So, yes, we interviewed uh, Tracy Barnett. Our first ever interview was Phil Vecchione, which is what I was going to ask, who was on to um, promote Hydro Hacker Operatives, which sadly never seems to have gotten past Ashcan, which I really like the game, and I like the Ashcan. I have a signed copy of it, even. So that was cool. Um, and the other person we interviewed was Daniel Zayas, who was coming on our show to talk about a Kickstarter, but canceled the Kickstarter before being on, and then just kind of talked about his experiments in the board game industry, which was an interesting chat. It was it was a fascinating chat. A lot about crowdfunding and stuff. They are, I personally think they're worth listening to, especially if you want to know about Hydro Hackers, Ironetta. Um, all three of them were fun people to interview. They're, in, they're interesting people to listen to, well-spoken people. So I do suggest checking them out. But like I said, it just it was so different from what we usually do. It just didn't quite work out. Well, here's something else cool we thought we would share. So my kids are pretty awesome about supporting the show uh, all the time. They they actually listen to our podcast episodes. Uh, they tend to watch the YouTube VOD versions once we've edited. Um, they are in bed while we're recording live, or at least upstairs. <laughs> and and to be honest, they're really good on podcast night about being quiet and you know making sure they're in bed in time and helping us bring the games up and down for the backdrop. Like, honestly, I, I don't think I could have more supportive kids for what we do. Assuming they will be listening or watching this episode at some point. Thank you, Gwen and Genevieve from both of us. So one thing I want to share is that to help us celebrate episode 200, Gwendolyn, who's my oldest, made us a new podcast thumbnail image for YouTube which we're going to stop you start using on this very episode. Now, this matches our Twitch setup screen and our tech difficulty screen that hopefully you haven't had to see. I just took a moment to pop that up on the screen. For those of you who are here live or watching on demand later, thanks, Gwen. Now, before we move on, I have something else to share from Gwen, which I'm going to have to grab from my email. So, so there are two of us on this show, and while it is called the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, Sean is as much a part of this show as I am. So here we get <laughs> the new image of Sean to be as part of the show, there which right. I got to say, I think I get turned to be out on thumbnails. That works. Yes. I, yeah. I think that turned out fantastic. I appreciate uh, how, th how thick she thinks my hair is. <laughs> <laughs> you should have seen the first. So here is our new just setting up image with the two of us. Um, if you want something on the shirt, we could toss that in there. No, nah, blank, uh, blank shirts is all it is anymore yeah. these days. So we have the animated and non-animated version of that. And then we also have our new thumbnail with both of us instead of just one of us. So I thought that was pretty awesome. Sean did not know this was coming. Nope, nope. That was, that's a shock to me. So there you go. There we go. There we go. With the two out. Yeah, right? Yes, yes. We need. We do need Sean and Momo emotes. We need We need her to make yep. up some emotes. on. That's true. We'll have to make some Sean emotes. Yeah. Yes, and and that one fit in the image. Yep. yep. So there, there's there there's the Sean, and there's the two of us together. Excellent. She refused to cut out my thumb. She's like, nope, <laughs> the thumbs up's too important. There we go. And I'm like, yeah, that was that was more of a G plus thing that stuck around. So yeah, Sean <laughs> hadn't even seen those. That was a nope. surprise for him. He finished them up like minutes before the show went live. <laughs> like she's in here and she's like, what about this? What about that? And then I'm like, oh, I have some bad news for you. Sean got a haircut. <laughs> so. <laughs> 
there was significantly different hair not not long ago so i thought those were awesome yeah so no, thank absolutely. you very much gwen if you're listening or if you can hear me upstairs <laughs> thank you indeed well we're here to answer your game gaming and game night questions working with you to make your game nights better so we've been doing this podcast since 2018 uh, unbelievably and over 199.5 episodes have gone by uh, with some special episodes tossed in there and some of the interviews we were talking about earlier. Now, the question I think we both get asked the most often, especially on social media, is what's your favorite game? Now, sometimes this comes in the form of what's your top five games right now? Other times it's more specific, like what's your favorite Star Trek game? A question we answered just last week. Now, other times it's people asking, have you ever done a top 100 games of all time list? And now and then people know. just want to know what we're playing right now. So kind of throwing those all together in the same pot, I figured the best way to answer the majority of them at once would be to do a top 25 games of all time list. We're not the Dice Tower. We're not going to do a top 100 and split it up into 10 different episodes. We're just going to spend one episode talking about our top 25. Now, the problem with this is my tastes change a lot, sometimes week to week, sometimes day to day. Um, and this is especially true based on game weights. Some weeks, and in general, I consider myself a heavier gamer. I like meteor, medium to heavyweight euros, sometimes some really heavy meaty stuff like Arkwright. But then on a week like this week, I just want to sit down and play some Racco. So that is what it probably affects my top list the most, or at least want to want to play right now. And also, we play a lot of games, yeah. many of which are new to us. Either games we've picked up, review copies that have come in, or now that they're happening again, ga games we've played at public play events. Mm -hmm. With trying new games so often, it's possible that we'll try a new game any given week that rockets up to be a top 25. Yeah. So the, while we're calling it a top 25 games of all time list, it's really a top 25 games of right now list. Now, I made one of these before because, as mentioned, I get asked this a lot, especially when we first launched the show. Like, that was the your new podcasters, what games do you like? Which makes sense. I think people want to be able to judge the kind of games I was into in order to determine how much weight things like our reviews and game recommendations would have for them. So this is a pretty common thing. How do you know you can trust a reviewer if you don't know the games they've played and what their personal tastes are? Exactly. Now, something I'm going to do that I couldn't do last time is I made a top 25 list is to compare it to the old one. So this way, we'll see what games are brand new on the list and any of the ones that are still on there have changed rank. And I've also got a list of the games that fell off my top 25. Now, also totally new this year, Sean's going to be on the images. We got to get him on the show answering questions, too. So we're also going to get Sean here to give us his first ever top 25 games list. Right. First time doing this. Now that I feel I've played enough different games to actually warrant making a list that isn't just the 25 games I've played or something. Yes. Similar. Now, usually for these games lists, we present them in no particular order, but this time around, they are very much in order. Uh, we're going to start with number 25, um, working our way up to number one. I'll share my game and then Sean will share his. One thing that may be of interest to people is that we each created our lists in isolation using the Pub Meeple board game ranking engine. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what games are on Mo's list, though I have a pretty good idea. And he had no idea what was on my list. Lots of deck builders. That's what I expect, though. I did see the list because we had to put it in the notes and there's one that's not on there. I was shocked. Now, maybe once we're done, we'll actually check if we have any overlap and what games overlap. So I think the games that overlap would be the tabletop bellhop best games you can purchase because we both like them. Now on to the list. Starting. No, oh. no, no, hold on. I think before we get going, it's time for another piece of tabletop bellhop trivia and a door prize for the first person who answers correctly in our chat room. All right. Sure, why not? While our show can sometimes seem rather board game focused, we really are about tabletop games, including RPGs. So here's a related question. Hey, what was the first RPG product we reviewed during a tabletop bellhop podcast episode? Ooh. Note, not the first review on the blog. 
That's a tricky one. This 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 it could is. catch people up. I I I will be impressed, honestly, if, if people people can get this one. I I don't honestly know if I could have gotten this yeah. one without without researching. Uh, to be honest, I had to research this one. There, there we, we got go. it. The sea otter. The sea otter gets it. The sea otter gets it. All right. It is never unprepared. The cre- complete game master's guide to session prep. All right, uh, the Sea Otter, you can hit that website I just dropped into the chat. Pick your prize and uh, let <laughs> and she Games know. I actually thought it was Shadow of the Demon Lord. Like, if, if it was off the top mm. of my head and I had to think, um, the actual game we first reviewed on the blog was White Star, which mm. is a white box sci-fi game. And it, right. was, it was a two post, but actually talked about on the podcast. What I forgot to do is um, note what podcast episode it was from. Wow. Because I had done that for some of the later trivia questions. So with that out of the way, let's move on to our 25 list, starting with number 25. All right, for me, this is Through the Ages, A New Story of Civilization. On my last list, because I did, like, we only talked about 25, this was number 35 on my old list. So this has moved up 10 points. Uh, This is a fantastic civ building game. That is probably the best civ building game out there, but a lot of people don't like the fact it doesn't have a map. So you're basically playing Civ 2 without a map. I love this game. This game is fantastic, but it is three to six hours long, and people can get frustrated by it because you have to play well or you can basically be eliminated. Now, personally, I feel that if you're going to play a game about civilization, if you choose to ignore military, Getting screwed over in the last couple rounds of the game because you have no military by the people who do is just part of the game and not a flaw in design. But I have friends who think the game is broken because of that. I have had people rage quit this game after losing due to not keeping up their military. But it's civilization. Of course, you have to keep up your military. That's the way I feel about it. I I think arguably the the art, uh, what you could say is. Be, just because our civilization relies on military conquest doesn't mean that an abstract civilization must rely on military to win. What, so it, it, it shouldn't be that you require that the only path to victory requires military, okay. is I think the argument. I, I'm not necessarily that's right, yeah. but I, I can see where that thought process comes through. Except this is very much based on our history with actual historic yeah, figures very, and actual very places. <laughs> like, this is not a, a raise a new civilization. It does say a new story. And the thing is, you don't have to have the most military. You don't have to have the best. And you can go through the entire game without waging a single war. But if you build none, you're going to have a problem. Yeah. All right. Well, my number 25 is Horizons, a different kind of sort of civilization build. The 4X sci-fi uh, yes. game. Horizons. Now, what I need to know is this horizons with extermination or without, or it doesn't matter. Uh, I would say without. I, I yeah, hor- the extermination. I understand why it was needed. I understand that it adds a valuable X to the game and rounds it out into a full four X game. Uh, but I wasn't in love with the game after it arrived. Fair. I personally prefer with it in. It does add take that elements to the game and makes it less multiplayer solitaire. Although it wasn't really a multiplayer solitaire because you're also fighting over planets and taking stuff. Uh, this is a pseudo deck builder that I really enjoy from Daily Magic Games. So, yep. Number 24, Raiders of the North Sea. I don't know what it is about this particular X of the whatever game from Garfield, but I, I just adore this game. Uh, this was not on my old list because I did it back in 2018 and had never played Raiders of the North Sea. It is now my number 24. I'd love the put a Viking out or take one away. You get the action when you put out and you get when you take away. It's not or, sorry, and. You're putting one out and you're taking one away. And then the whole thing where you have to do some raids to get different levels of Vikings. My only problem with the game is that the dark gray Vikings look like the black Vikings. Other than that, to me, this is almost a perfect game. There's something about that game that just really suits me and the group I play with. It's also one of Deanna's favorite games. It's great two-player. Um, we don't even own all the expansions yet. I did get the Hall of Heroes, which I like. Um, and does add to the game, but I don't even have all the expansion for it. Even just the base game is fantastic. All right. And my number 24 is DC Comics deck building game, the base DC <laughs> Comics deck building game, the original, the OG DC Comics deck building game, which is which is up there. That's the multi-universe box up there. Oh, but yeah, okay. it's in there. It's, it's, it's in that box. <laughs> there you go. 
Yeah, this one I'm not a huge fan of, but I totally get why you're into it. This one, when I first played it, it really bothered me that it didn't like you were playing Batman. You had the Batcave, but I now have the Lasso of Truth and I have it just felt weird. Yeah. It didn't feel like I was building a team. It felt like I was playing a character because I had a character card. But then I was using stuff from all over DC, and that just bothered me as a purist. Yeah. No, and absolutely. The, the, the fact that you have a character yeah. does conflict with the rest of the game. Mm -hmm. um absolutely 100 uh, and and it's you, i can't even i can't even deny that, that <laughs> problem like, with yeah. the game it, it's true uh but the fact of the matter is as a deck building game the rest of it just works so well yeah. i'm willing to overlook that one kind of tricky thing you yeah. know maybe they're the leader of the team and uh, or yeah, something I i'm sure i could yeah. probably justify it if i really wanted to but I'm, but I'm, no it's 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 a flaw in the concept it is that, that was my problem with it and to be honest the next time i played i think was with you or with tori Someone had brought over a version and we played and I'm like, no, this is better now that I know what I'm getting into and what to expect. Yep. Yeah, no, absolutely. Number 23 for me is key flower. Big drop here. Rank four down to rank 23. Oof. Still in my top 25. Main reason for that is I haven't played this game since 2018. I haven't even touched it. And it suffers from two problems. One, I built a box insert for it. That <laughs> dooms any game. Second, there are two expansions for it. One adds breadth, one adds depth. They're both awesome. But both make it more difficult to teach the game to someone who hasn't played before, and they're not easily removed. So it's one of those games where I'm like, oh, you got to try Keyflower, but then I got to sort through everything. I got to pull out the expansion. Then I got to teach it, and it's not an easy teach because it uses a very unique meeple-based auction where you don't know how many meeple people have, and they're bidding on things. And I, I love the game, but it's just not hitting my table. And there's a trivia question I could have thrown in. That just goes against the Bellhop's first rule. Fair enough. Uh, my number 23 is Azul. Uh, I think earlier uh, in the podcast, this would have been much higher, mm -hmm. but we have played a lot of games since then. Uh, it does still remain on there, though, especially thanks to the BGA implementation, which yeah. has given it a whole new life with us. Uh, because of the quick and easy way of playing yeah. without actually having to set up and deal with yummy little uh, tasty chiclet pieces. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, this was, I think, like number two or three last year. I don't I don't have that list in front of me and completely dropped off the 20, top 25. I still like it. But we played it kind of has the Catan problem of we played so much of it for a while there. I got a little tired of it. And just there's so many other games I played since. Yeah, I find, you know, flip because we started flipping over to the other yeah, that side, made a difference. that made a huge difference. Otherwise, it, without that, it might not have actually even made my top 25. Yeah, yeah, it's true. The The blank side is kind of neat. What you have to try sometime you're over is I have the the crystal. Is it crystal mosaic? The the expansion yeah, that yeah. has two more boards. Yeah, whatever that one's called. 22. Clans of Caledonia wasn't on the list before because I hadn't played it yet. I, I don't even know how to describe this game. It's a, a market game, a resource management game, uh, area. I don't even know what you're taking over parts of the map. You're, you're trying to make connected cities with some weird rules. Uh, there's fulfilling contracts. Uh, this game is just fantastic. And I don't know how to describe it. Like it, it's from Karma Games. Uh, Juma Jubu or something is the name of the designer. I'm sorry. I'm getting that messed up. Um, I, I just, I was, I was smitten by this game. Now, again, I made the mistake. I built a box insert for it, so it hasn't seen as much play as it should have. But I still love Clans of Caledonia, ranked at 22. And that designer is Juma Aljuju. See, I was close. I was close. Juma Aljuju. Uh, with art by Clemens Frones. <laughs> now, before we go on, just hi, I would love to hear in the chat. Have you played any of these? Let us know. Have you played this one? What do you think of each yeah. game on our list? Feel free to feel free to chat away while we're uh, going through this list. My number 22 is Anachrony, specifically the Infinity Box, but that's because oh. it's the only version I've played. <laughs> now, but even then, the Infinity Box just blows away the it's, old yeah, one, just yeah, it's, it's, with, with part organization, the way you track different things. It's, it, it's worth it in many ways. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's just a fantastic game. All right, my next one, well, sorry, we're on to 21. 21 for me is Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade. Uh, too new to be on the old list. A deck builder that blew us away because we were expecting a possibly Cowboy Bebop themed Tante Coro or, or Dominion, something light and, and pasted on theme, and instead got one of the best deck builders I've ever played. That it includes some neat board game mechanics as well as a lot. 
of uh, moving people around and take that mechanics you don't usually see in a deck builder. Yeah, the, the use of all characters, no matter how many players are involved, uh, is just a really interesting uh, mechanism. So, yes, yes, thumbs up to Cowboy Bebop, even though it didn't actually slip into my top 25. Yeah, that was this is the one that shocked me. I'm like, I know it was, it was on both of our best of 2022 games, the new to us games last year, yep. but I thought it'd be higher for Sean. I thought he enjoyed it more than some of these other games he's got higher up. Well, my number 21 is another tableau builder, deck builder, however you want to call it, deck mashup, uh, and that is Unfair. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the theme park management game with that is un, 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 surprisingly uh, unfair and, and has taken that aspect, despite it being a mechanic that I don't normally enjoy. Yeah. Uh, for some reason, Unfair topped out Funfair for me mm -hmm. uh, as, as the better game. Yeah, myself as well. Unfair was great. Then I played, or sorry, Funfair. Funfair. We we actually got them. Like Unfair came out first, then they put out Funfair as kind of an intro. Well, I tried them in the opposite order, which I'm glad I did. Mm -hmm. I loved Funfair. Absolutely. Until I played Unfair. Yeah, Funfair is fantastic in that it's pared down. So especially yeah. if you've got younger players at the table or you mm -hmm. want a far more relaxing, easygoing game, Funfair is the game for you. But if you want something with a little more meat and you, and you aren't afraid of a little bit of take that, then Unfair really steps it up and, and sort of surpasses Funfair notably. All right. Number 20 for me is Robo Rally. Uh, old rank seven. Robo Rally used to be my favorite game. And I still adore the original Avalon Hill lead miniature Richard Garfield three different expansion boxes version of this game. I don't love the modern Hasbro version. It's good, but it's not great. They watered it down a little bit too much for me. And just because of that, pulling out my old game and dusting it off and getting people to play it is difficult. And the new one, I don't love as much. It's just not getting played as often. Thus the big drop. Now that said, Renegade Games has announced a brand new edition of Robo Rally. And I applied for a review copy yesterday. And even if I don't get accepted for that one, I might have to go pick up a copy because of how much I used to love Robo Rally. It just it's dropped. I just I'm not playing it enough. Like the, I can talk about again, the bellhops first rule. I can talk about it as much as I want. But if I'm not playing the game, how good a game is it? Absolutely. Yeah. No. And for me now, interestingly, another one that doesn't yeah. get played off and in fact, has only ever been played once. And my, number 20 for me is Weather Machine. And this is just because of the potential this game has. There How fantastic this game can be uh, if we can ever get it to the table a couple of times within a, the same month yes. to learn and remember all the ins and the outs of what is a very heavyweight game yeah. uh, with a lot of moving parts and a lot of complexity uh, that really, I mean, I know I've, to be fair, I backed this. I, I yeah, I had some some monetary. Yeah, there might be there it. might be some buyer bias here, but I don't think there so. could be. But I mean, I bought it essentially for you. I didn't honestly yeah. think I was going to enjoy this game. It yeah. is a heavy, heavy game from a designer that you love with an artist. Well, an artist we all love. Yeah, um, <laughs> who doesn't but, love Ian O'Toole? <laughs> exactly. But uh, really, it was a game for you and D because it, it had that heavy weight. Yep. And then when I sat down to play it, I went, oh, my God, this is heavy. But the interactions are so fulfilling. There's so much mm -hmm. you get out of that weight that it really caught my eye. And that's Weather Machine. I'm still shocked that you enjoyed Weather Machine that much. I'm like, oh, now there's hope. Sean might enjoy heavier <laughs> games than he thought. He's on that part of the, the life cycle of the board gamer. Yeah. You can check our episode. He's on the, oh, oh, you know what? Actually, I don't mind heavy games. Next, we move to number 19. And that is Valeria Card Kingdom's old favorite. Um, I think there was some bias here because we've been playing other Valeria games and I'm fondly thinking about the brand. I don't know if I was hating on the game last time in 2018 or what, but I had it ranked at 55, which just seems wrong, way too low. Maybe I was mad about something. But yeah, I have Valeria Card Kingdoms. We need to play it again. We need to get that out and get that to the table. We've been playing all the small box Valeria games. I've even played Quests and... Um, Villages of Valeria more often recently than I played Card Kingdoms. My problem is I'll still mess up the Dukes every time. Yeah, <laughs> but we'll have to like show me your Duke and we'll explain it. Because yeah. really, yeah. are you going to play different against someone else because their Duke's different? All right. So my number 19 is Emotep. 
Uh, just yeah. a great, solid, fun game that just, it, I mean, it just keeps coming back as a fun game to play. There's just no other way about it, around it. Honestly, that that's one of my favorite welcoming games now. The the base game with the A sides, we have the expansion, so we actually have, uh, what is it, 1,028 different possible board combinations, and no, we haven't tried them all. <laughs> it's just so great for getting people and blowing their minds like this is a board game. Like I, this is, this is one we we need to get this one out to the barbershop bar actually. Cause it's mm. been long enough, yeah. but yeah, great. I, I don't even know what you call it. It's like, it's, it's not draft. Like what is the main mechanic there? Mm. You're drafting cubes, but then picking worker placement spots, but then there's a reward for getting there first. And then you're picking what order you want to be on. Like, I don't even know. So what, the what... Uh, our area majority is okay well yeah for the scoring in most yeah but again that's only most of the spots Work, worker placement and area majority yeah. is what they claim okay yeah. so interesting I mean, there's set then collection there's the card drafting there's set collection in there's there as set well collection yeah so it, it, it does not classify itself well <laughs> put cubes on boats bring boats boats to uh monuments unload cubes get points that's 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 the mechanics yep. <laughs> all right 18 concordia was 15 a little bit of a drop, again, I think mainly because I haven't gotten at the table. This is one I finally picked up Salsa, which is supposedly the must-have expansion. And I read the rules for Salsa, but then I'm like, man, we haven't played Concordia in so long. And we played two games of Concordia one week after each other. And I was like, yeah, this game's good. I like this game so much. And then we're like, now we got to play with Salsa. And it never happened. I think that's when the RSV virus hit uh, something. I think it was last November. It just ended up sick. And it never got played. So now I'm back at the point where if I play Concordia again, I'm not just going to toss in Salsa. I'm going to want to play with the base game. And maybe I'll never get the Salsa. But Concordia is still fantastic. To me, it's kind of like the quintessential Euro. Like you do all the Euro things. You're building routes. You're moving people along routes. You're collecting goods. You're buying and selling goods. It's like totally. So so Jeff Seuss is saying to toss in Salsa too. Maybe I should just toss it in. Like, I don't think it's that hard. What it adds is salsa is actually um, a word for salt. And salt is a wild card ingredient. You can use it for anything else. And and I think that what it's supposed to do is open it up so it, the, no one has an advantage by like, oh, you got all the silk spots. Now there's ways to pay for it. Right. There you go. It won't add a lot. This is with Jeff helping us out here. Yeah, I got to do it. Maybe we'll just have Jeff over <laughs> and we'll play Concordia and he can help us teach it. So my number 18, I think, has been influenced by our Discord. Because uh, that's Castles of Mad King Ludwig, which I've only played a couple of times in one on one day. Yep. But uh, people do keep po posting pictures of it in our Discord when they get it played. Uh, and it is definitely a solid game. Although I have to say, I, I think I preferred it without all the expansion stuff. Or maybe that was just because we had issues with, with setting it up and the setup of that. Yeah, we, we, was... I, I hate expansions. Where you can't just toss everything in. I hate them. That, that has become a pet peeve of mine. And honestly, it's a reason Mad King Ludwig probably isn't on my top 25 list. As well as why Among the Stars isn't even considered on my list tonight. I hate these expansions. Or um, the Aztecs expansion for um, Imperial Settlers. Imperial Settlers, just like Concordia. I got an expansion for it, but hadn't played the base game in so long. Started playing it. Played three times in a row. Brenda loved it. He really enjoyed it. He's like, man, I don't think you ever showed me this game. We fell re back in love with Imperial Settlers. So we grabbed the Aztec expansion, and instead of, boom, here you go. Just uh, you play the Aztecs, you take the Aztec deck. No, here's all these cards that you can put with your base game, but you got to swap them out for equal level cards. And then they turn it into a deck construction game, which requires prep ahead of time. And I just, I don't end up doing it. So... Yeah. Lidwig and less like having to pull out the expansions is annoying, but even more so the way you build the rooms is like X of the normal ones and X of the swan rooms and shuffle them. So then you got to sit there and at the start of the game, take all your tiles, separate out the swan ones, shuffle the swan ones, shuffle the not swan ones, shuffle those together, put so many out, put the rest of the, like it's just a mess. Yeah, they made it into a great video game and a lousy board game in some ways. <laughs> And yes, uh, 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 CR and, and yeah. Anchi games. I, I wish we had the funds at that time. Yeah. If it had launched like in January, February, as we're getting checks from November <laughs> and Black Friday are coming in, that, that, that probably would have got backed. And it, I hadn't even played it when that came out. So I wasn't, uh, it wasn't, I mean, other than, uh, oh, interesting, because I know you guys love it. It wasn't really on my list at all. So. All right. You know what? I'm, I'm going to throw in a trivia here. It wasn't on our original list. Where we are going to throw in, it is door prize time. Before I get to the next one on my list, 
we got a we got an easy one to Google. The last time I did this was in 2018. What was my number one game in 2018? Ooh. Only hint is it's not number one this year. What Azul was number two. Oh, there we go. Literally number two. So the, you're off by one. There we go. Tech ha- tech gets it. Tech, tech with got terraforming it with Mars. Terraforming Mars. Yes, my number 17 is Terraforming Mars. A uh, fantastic game that just, again, hasn't been played mainly because of the pandemic. It's a game I tend to bring out to public play events. And to be honest, oh, Deanna still likes it. But like Deanna, Kat, and Tori are all like, that's the group I played a lot with. Where are, I kind of saw a lot of Terraforming Mars. <laughs> so I, you know, and interestingly, I, I still have not played with, I think, the majority of the expansions. I've played with a couple the, of them. The good one is Turmoil. As, yeah. as long as you play with Turmoil, because Turmoil like makes the game better. Because it kind of kickstarts your startup and it gives you some direction at the beginning. Right. But uh, but yeah, no, I, there's uh, most of the most of the expansions I haven't actually played with. Uh, so my number 17 is another one that's I know a favorite of Mo's in at least historically, if not on his yes. top 25, and that is Eminent Domain. Uh, another yeah, fantastic uh, deck builder. Uh, another sci-fi game, big shock, mm-hmm. uh, midweight, uh, a game where you're just, you know, surveying planets, trading resources and building tech, uh, you know, a, a really solid game from TMG. Now I will say with this one, I think you need expansions though. I don't even know if Sean ever played just the base yeah, game. I know we at yeah, least had not. the first expansion, which I think is a must have. Um, it rebalances it so that using the the red resource which generates fighters can actually work. Yes. You want to have that. Yeah. The big problem with this game, though, is this is a game that only works well once you start having some system mastery. And it's all based on the technology deck. Because this is a card game with a tech tree where when you build the technology, you literally get to grab this entire deck and pick your card. The AP for that can be terrible. Figuring out combos can be terrible. But as long as you play a bunch of games in a row... Eminent Domain's fantastic. Like there was a bit there where we were working our way through the first three expansions, and we played a lot, and I was loving it at that time. Yeah. Nope. Solid, uh, solid game. That's Eminent Domain from Tasty Minstrel Games. So my number sixteen is a huge jump. Previously fifty three, and that is Zaya Legends of Adrift system. And the reason for that jump, they put out an expansion that fixed the marketplace. That is all it took. They put out an expansion where the value of goods changed based on their rarity, and it's now valid to be able to just run a shipping route back and forth. And it's now more valid to be a pirate or something else because the one player who happened to make the one route that was worth the most points can no longer just run that the entire game because every time they run it, it becomes worth less. Um, that is the something Fallen Star. I didn't even tape a note of Embers of a Fallen Star. Embers. I think it's the name. Yeah, Embers. Embers of a Fallen Star for Zaya made it awesome. So not the base game, but if uh, you forsaken get star embers of a forsaken star, there we go. Embers of a forsaken star made Zaya better. It was already in my top hundred games. I love Zaya, but Zaya used to be like a, a silly romp. I played where I laughed when I got twenties and got extra points into a, I am enjoying this game. I feel like I am someone you're in space. You got to ship do what you want. And I could do what I wanted. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, my number 16, as we shift at a hard uh, left hand <laughs> turn away from a couple of science fiction games is Orleans. Um, again, this is one that I previously would have stayed away from. It's that, yep. ooh, it, this is a, this is a, it's weighty, a little meaty. This is yeah. a weighty euro. Ooh, I don't know if this is really going to. And then I played it uh, and oh, it's like, no, I, I really enjoy this game. And I don't know why, because nothing about this game screams out that I would like it. It's not sci fi, it's not deck building. Mm-hmm. It's it's meatier and weightier than a lot of what I do. Uh, the Euros in general haven't really, you know, hooked me. But for some reason, Orléans did. And mm-hmm. it just worked. Yeah, fantastic game. Yeah. Next, number 15. I have a game everyone is jealous I own now because it is long out of print and you're probably never going to be able to get it again. And that is Warhammer 40,000 Forbidden Stars. Sci-fi 4X Twilight Imperium kind of style game in space, but it's Warhammer with orcs, the Empire, the Eldar, and all that fun stuff. I this is a fantastic game that Sean has got to play at some point. It's on those sci-fi games Sean needs to playlist that we just haven't gotten to it. 
They did a fantastic thing by having a board where it looks like everyone's adjacent to each other, but there's moving warp storms that cut off areas that make it so you can't just keep attacking the same person. It's mission based. It's asymmetric. And it's one of my favorite things, programmed movement. This is actually an update to the classic star uh, craft board game with the way you program your moves in stacks of orders that you re then resolve top down. So you see me put a counter out and then Sean puts one on top and thinks my first thing is to move troops there. And then he's going to move his troops to attack, but it ends up my first thing was to set a trap. That's how you play Forbidden Stars. All right. Well, the next one is one that I don't think anyone thought would be on anyone's lists. <laughs> yes, uh, a year ago. Until, and yeah, even, well, not even a year. I mean, six, six eight months ago. Yep. And that is Scythe. This is a game that we had bad experiences with. Everyone had bad experiences with it. Mm -hmm. uh, my first play of it was with the online Steam version that I picked up in a, in a humble bundle. And it was so obtuse. I didn't understand it. The tutorial made no sense. The game just fell flat for me completely. Yeah. And now, having sat down and played sides with some great friends and fun people... Scythe is now number 15 on my top games list. I'm not going to say anything else anymore right now because my number 14 would be Scythe. <laughs> For all the reasons Sean just mentioned, had a bad experience the first time I played it. I'm now hooked. Absolutely adore this game. Behind me, uh, you can't quite see it, but there are two Scythe expansions waiting for me to open them up to make the game hopefully even better. I can't believe how... I, I, how I how did I miss it that first game? Like how how did it go that badly that I didn't give it a ch chance? And here, huge huge thanks to our fans who kept insisting you got to try it, you got to try it, you got to try it. And thanks to Jamie Stegmeyer for eventually offering up a review copy and going, "Fine, our fans want us to try it. Let's give it a try and we'll find out." Yeah, yeah, Scythe. I, I we're eating crow on this one. Yeah, I, you know what? And this one just goes to prove that the teach and the group that you play a game with makes such a huge difference in the experience mm -hmm. of the same game. We can yes. go from a game that we have no interest in ever touching again to a game that we have love and are eagerly grabbing expansions for just because of who we were playing with. Yep. So I was Sean's 15 and my 14 side. Now my 14 is Dominion. Uh, an old, a classic, but Again, it's it's that, you know, gotta love the deck builders. Yeah. And Sean hadn't played this one and actually came over. He was playing all these modern deck builders. I'm like, <laughs> you know what? Let's sit back and let's go to the grandfather, right? Uh, to be fair, it wasn't the first deck builder, but it was the first modern deck builder where there's a market to buy from and all the stuff that we're now used to seeing in every deck. Yep. Uh, Dominion, people love. I admit, I'm still not a huge fan. To me, it's just, it's, it's, I hate the fact it's not a variable market. What I don't like about Dominion is that it's a puzzle. You sit down, you figure the puzzle out of the cards, and whoever figures that puzzle out wins. I much prefer the randomness of, oh, there's a cool ship, and building combos as I go, as opposed to trying to figure out the puzzle. Now, maybe it's because I have played with some Dominion Sharks, <laughs> and it's Sean's complaint about Catan. Is, is Most of the games of Dominion I played with are people who own every set for Dominion, I played a million and a half games and just destroy me when I play. So that could be some of the reason, but generally I like a little bit more out of my deck builders than Dominion. Fair enough. Next, my number 13, Tyrants of the Underdark. And I'm not sure why this wasn't ranked before. I, maybe I didn't get it until 2018. I think I think you I think this one popped up later on your list. Yeah, on, on so your... so I know I got a review copy at Origins, and maybe I got it at Origins 2018. This, to me, was the first combination deck builder board game. Everyone likes to talk about Arnak and Dune. This did it way before that. This is an area majority war game with dudes on a map, folk on a map, sorry, folk on a map, and deck building combined, where one of your resources is for controlling the board and the other resources for improving your deck. It's drow themed and does some fantastic stuff to tie in that theme with assassinations and spies and a promotion system that I think is utterly brilliant as a way to both score points and to thin your deck. Now, this one just did get reprinted at a lower price point with both expansions, like, or sorry, all the expansion decks, the one expansion came with multiple decks, all in the box now, but way less plastic. And I don't know how I feel about that, but I'm glad I have my original copy. 
And I, frankly, Tyrants of the Underdark, I think it's got a lot of potential. It doesn't make my list primarily because it benefits from system mastery. And yeah. when I played it with Mo and D, they had been playing it constantly for mm. quite some time uh, and sitting down with experts in the game or not experts, well, well, well-rounded players in the game as a new player puts yeah. you at a significant disadvantage in that game. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that, that did color my opinion of the game. I have to say. Totally fair. Uh, my What's number, your 13? My number 13, jumping right back into a theme and back to something you've already covered. And that's Zaya legends of Adrift. Again, you've got to have the embers of a forsaken star. Yeah. Fantastic. Game. Yep. Sticking with sci-fi games, our number 12s both fall into that category. Mine is Alien Frontiers. This one actually dropped. I had this at nine. It dropped to 12. John has finally tried it, but hasn't played it nearly enough to have the mastery that we do. But what a great, to me, this was the definitive dice placement game where your workers are dice, you roll the dice, and then use the outcomes on the dice to decide what to do. I don't think anyone done it, did it before. It's also one of the first ever big board game Kickstarter successes that then went on to, I think, six different editions, each improving the components. Big props to my friend Jamie Shepard, Will Chamberlain in the chat, if he happens to be on tonight. He backed the original Kickstarter, then backed another one for an upgrade kit and got me hooked on this game. This, to me, is the perfect one hour to an hour and a half sci-fi game. All right, and my next one is, again, sci-fi all over again, Eclipse, Second Dawn for the Galaxy. Uh, A little bit longer than uh, Alien Frontier. (laughs) (laughs) And this is the re-implementation of Eclipse, of course. Which Sean never played the original Eclipse, but they are very similar. It's just better Eclipse. And again, we have the Kickstarter, so there's the added bonus of awesome inserts and the, the I don't know if I still, I, I'm still on the fence about the new player boards for tracking your resources compared to the old, but they did improve a bunch of other things, including adding all the expansions. Fantastic sci-fi game. Um, to me, this one's better than um, most other big 4X games. Yep. Uh, and some really great iconology in there. Uh, I uh, In there. Um, yeah, they've really done some great some great things with this game. And again, it's sci-fi. So, yeah. And from the chat room, I'm going to have to quote Ryan here because he's right on. Does Second Dawn eclipse the original? Yes, it does. <laughs> Next up is our number 11s, starting with mine, which is Brass Birmingham. Uh, this was not on my list because Birmingham is the new version of Blast. There were two versions. We paid to kickstart these because I loved Brass so much. Brass was at one time the ugliest game in my collection. It is a fantastic Martin Wallace train game, route building game, resource management game. Absolutely adored it. And it was ugly as sin. I have to thank Roxley Gaines for giving it a nice visual update. But at the same time, they also worked with a new designer who worked with Wallace to put out Birmingham, which is Brass with beer is what a lot of people like to call it. It is a slightly twisted version of Brass with a new resource in it, opening up more options. Uh, the new production's fantastic. I will admit I'm slightly biased because I backed the Kickstarter and I have the awesome iron clays that went with it, but I adore the original brass. This was a neat update to the original. And uh, pointing out in the in the chat room that the new BGG top game, Brass. Uh, but is we it? liked it. We liked it before it became BGG top. But that is not Birmingham. That is not the game we're talking about right now. Your number 11? My number 11 is The Crew Quest for Planet Nine. Just a solid game. And I mean, we everyone in the, who's watched this show ever, even once before, knows we are a fan of Trick Takers. And The yes. Crew just did a fantastic job of having a Trick Taker. Uh, we've still never gotten through it. I I think 28 or 30 or something like that. 30 something. Yeah, we're in as, there. As I remember 30 gave us a real hard time. I do remember yeah. that. But uh, hopefully we can get that back to the table again sometime. Uh, But yeah, the crew quest for Planet Nine is just a solid look at Trick Takers. Down to the top 10. For me, my number 10 game is Russian Railroads. This one actually moved up quite a bit. It was my rank 27. Um, The only problem with this game is that I did not have the money to back Ultimate Railroads. 
which included German railroads as well as a new expansion, including Canadian railroads. Now, based on all those railroad names, um, including the stupidest name expansion ever, Russian railroads, colon, German railroads, um, this is not actually a rope building game. You are buying and laying track. You are, it's an economic game about building stops and improving your track levels and improving your trains. This is to me the ultimate engine building game. And yes, I get the pun. This is a game where in round one, you're going to be happy to score seven points. And in the final round of the game, you're going to spend five minutes adding everything up to realize you made 380 points. And then the game stops before you get to run that engine one more time. And it's just like the perfect time. I love the, this series of games. Russian railroads and then German railroads just improved it by providing new boards. I, this is a game. This is because Sean enjoyed Weather Machine. I wanted to try this one now. And and when you tell me it's not a route builder, I, I become yeah. interested, infinitely more interested. Yes, it is uh, not a route builder. <laughs> no route building at all. Uh, my number 10 takes a sharp left turn from Russian railroads into the evil that is Forever Evil, the DC Comics deck building expansion. Forever Evil added. Uh, a bunch of new mechanics and tokens and things that happen in the game to really sort of broaden out the experience of what DC Comics deck building offered. Mm -hmm. uh, it was no longer just a really simple, basic, uh, almost Dominion level, except for the multi, you know the variable yeah. marketplace where you're just worrying about attack and buy. Uh, you got a whole lot more flexibility and uh, resources to manage when you got forever evil now this doesn't happen often this isn't one i played <laughs> i have not tried this game at all number nine wallenstein thank you neil for getting me to play this game with your german copy with photocopied <laughs> printed out at work english rules taped onto the cards and got me hooked on cube tower games i love this dirk hen War game. This Wallenstein, there's another version of it called Shogun, which we may talk about later. Um, Wallenstein is more cutthroat. The map of Germany, everything's connected. It's easy to get anywhere. You're fighting with the cube tower. You're programming your movement because you have a card for every province. You decide what happens in every province. But it's not as much of a war game as you'd think. You can only ever make two attacks per turn and you don't play a lot of turns. Plus, the actual victory points are for building buildings. And this shows how often I play Wallenstein and Shogun. I can't remember what the buildings are in Wallenstein. I remember what they are in, in Shogun, but there are three levels of building, like palaces, theaters, and churches or something. You're actually getting points for controlling territories that have those in them. So you don't necessarily win by winning the most wars, which I think is brilliant. And that cube tower, the way reinforcements work, the way you have to tax your people, the way the farmers can revolt, I adore Wallenstein. I have to say the cube tower games have not won me over the way nope. uh, the way they have with Mo. My number nine is one that I've still never actually played with Mo, uh, <laughs> but this is Suburbia. This is one D actually introduced me to at uh, must have been Breakout uh, Queen City. I was think it, it Queen was. City. I think it was the one Queen City. No, I think to. it was actually Breakout. Was it Breakout? I think okay. it, I think you were you were role playing at Breakout, and uh, okay. D and I went into the game and and taught me suburbia uh and i since went on and grabbed the app which is uh, a fun implementation yeah, of it and uh have played a ton of suburbia um yeah and he's saying yes it was breakout okay uh so yeah suburbia is a fantastic game that does not get to the table anywhere near often enough i promise suburbia is another uh fomo uh not even fomo what's fomo after the fact where you <laughs> did miss out um, the, the, they had an awesome Kickstarter for a deluxe edition with this tower and stuff. And I'm like, I didn't get the deluxe edition. Every time I see people sharing pictures, it looks better. So uh, I, see, that's what I don't know. I, it's such, I mean, the game doesn't need fancy components. Yeah, it's I so I also built a box insert. So, oh, well, there you go. <laughs> that's, that's the other problem. <laughs> All right. This, I, I just noticed our number eights and this is hilarious. It is be, because these get compared a lot. That is funny. I, I had not, again, I hadn't seen Sean's list. It's been in here like on on our, our our you know shared file we use but i hadn't gotten to see this uh my number eight is lost ruins of arnak uh not on the list because it didn't exist in 2018 um tyrants of the underdark might have been the first deck builder with a board but man does lost ruins of arnak do it well 
especially once you realize it's not really much of a deck builder. You are not cycling through your deck like you would in a normal deck builder. It's more of a like deck improvement game than a deck builder. You're not going to get through that deck multiple times. I there is the what I love about this game once you've learned to play is the squeeze out one more move. The looking at my two people, my two meeple, looking at where I can place them, going, it looks like I only get two actions this turn. Oh, but wait, if I move this meeple here, I can then get this thing that lets me tap this guy. They'll give me two more resources, which then I can use to buy this card from the market, which lets me return that meeple so that I can send them to this new spot, which will give me a temple token, which I can then put on my board to send out my second meeple over here. And then when he's there, I can't afford to defeat the monster that's there, but because I have this temple, I can turn it into extra arrows. Then with the leftover arrow, I'm going to move up on this track, which gives me another coin, which also lets me move up on this track. I love that puzzle and the feeling of pulling off a longer than you thought you were going to get turn. That that I stretched out one more thing. That is what I love about Arnak. Uh, and for my number eight, I went with Dune Imperium. <laughs> which, the, game... the reason this is funny, if people don't know it, is those two games came out around the same time. They both use deck building. They use a board. And everyone compares them. And everyone likes one more than the other. And I think everyone's wrong. I don't think they are <laughs> comparable at all. Uh, I think they are both solid, good games in their own realms. But to think that they are the same or similar, no. I, I don't I don't get it all. Even having played them both on the same day, yes, I don't I don't see see it. Uh, but yep. I am a sci-fi fan. I am a longtime Dune fan, and I think Dune Imperium did it well. I can't wait to see how the expansions bring even more to the table. Another one announced yesterday. Oh, they really? are pumping them out ridiculously. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's immortality, I think, or immatorium, something. It was just announced yesterday. Ooh. I I dug Dune Imperium, but Dune Imperium is a deck builder. You're going to go through your deck multiple times. Everyone starts with the same starter deck. You're going to shuffle a bunch of times. You're going to buy cards that bring things out of your deck. And yes, there's worker placement elements as well, and it's well done. It's very different from Arnak. Immort Arnak, the cards in your hand are resources. They're not really a deck or an engine. Uh, immortality, the Benny immortality. Benny, Benny Fly Flylax uh expansion expansion there you go on to number seven would be the other version of brass which is brass rank lancashire which was the original brass like the original wasn't called lancashire so i don't know why they called the new one lancashire but this is the original brass reprinted broxley games put it this way the the graphic update and one simple rule change moved this from 42 to 7 that's how much of an improvement it made now the rule change is at any time, you can discard any two cards to use as any other card. That was not in the original game, and you could get stuck with a bad hand, or you could get cut off on the board so there was nowhere to move but to one city. And if you didn't have that city's card, you were screwed. Well, now you can discard two cards, you can get there. Completely fixed the only problem I ever had with Brass, except for how it looks, and this new version looks beautiful. So, to, to be fair, according to Board Game Geek, Brass... Brass Deluxe and Brass Lancashire are all the same game. Yes. But Brass Like I said, it's Birmingham such a minor change. Is Birmingham is a different game. Yeah. And yeah, Birmingham, there's different Birmingham, resource. Yeah, Birmingham is the one that's number one. Oh, Birmingham's number yeah, one. Yeah. Wow, okay. I thought Lancashire was number one. No, it's Birmingham. There you go. All right. And my number... Uh, where are we here? Oh, seven. Right. Yeah, we are on number seven. seven. My number seven is one we have talked about and people have complained about us talking about, but there may be goodness on the future. That is the Aventuria adventure card game as a whole, uh, rather yes. than any specific modules, because just the whole Very system uh, is, has been fantastic to enjoy. And I can't wait until everyone's vision is back up to snuff yes. and uh, health is good so that we can get back in to more. Aventuria Adventure Card Game. So what I'm going to do now, uh, you are welcome, Ulysses Spiel, is shout out their currently live Ends in Six Days Kickstarter. I just dropped a link in the show notes. And the reason this, I think, is important is that they fixed everything we complained about. Like, we love Aventuria. We adore Aventuria. Don't play the dual mode. The dual modes, whatever. There, there are much better dueling card games out there. That I'm sure people know many of them. Totally ignore that fact. The, the play, the story, 
is so dang good. And I don't know what my computer is doing right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it, it is so good. But what they did is they have now kickstarted a new two expansions that finally add the story that was missing. So what they have done now is you now have branching paths. You now have character levels. So when you get XP at the end, you don't just bump up one skill by one point to make your die rolls one easier. They now have talents that are asymmetric and unique to each characters. There's like something like 800 and something new cards in this thing. And the other thing they've done is they've rewritten all of the existing adventures with this new version. This new, what do they call it? They call it something. I'm trying to find the name of it. Path of Legends. Using the new Path of Legends. And like right, they box started off at 600 cards, but with stretch cold. There's proficiency staffs now for all 15 heroes that exist. That's 22 new cards for each of the heroes that already exist. Plus with stretch goals, 84 more um, new extra cards that are specific for leveling up. And they're better versions of your weapons and skills. Literally everything I complained about in Aventuria seems to have been addressed with these expansions. Yeah. So yeah, go check that out. Um, we should have reviewed this, but we got hit by COVID. Like that's, that's all I can say. So big shout out for that one, the Adventuria Adventure Card Game, Stories and Legends. If anyone's listening to this, there are six days left, which means if you are listening to this episode when it drops, you should still be able to back. What I'm trying to find out from them is if they're going to have a late pledge or a pre-order. It is funded. This is going to happen. Uh, we're just hoping that all the stretch goals can unlock. All right. That was seven. Now we move to number six, and I get, uh, I don't know if it's the first overlap on the list with Sean, but this is where I have Orléans. It has actually moved up from rank 10 to 6, and that, to me, is because of the Trade and Intrigue expansion. Trade and Intrigue offers, I think it was four different modules you can add to the game. One, you leave in the box. Don't bother with Intrigue. I don't think Orleone needs to take that, and I don't like the new Intrigue board compared to the other new board that comes in this, because there's already a replacement King's Court board. Uh, it just added more to the game I love, including more buildings you can buy and everything else. Orleone's fantastic. This is one of the games that at some point I may actually spend the money to geek up the bits. So instead of wooden tokens, there'll be little plastic ones like we did for Quacks Quedlinburg. It's one of the games I enjoy enough that I don't mind spending the cost of the game again to make it more tactile and enjoyable. Yeah, this one, fantastic, as I already uh, as I already pointed out. Uh, and uh, the one nice thing about Trade and Intrigue is if you are a person or have a group that does love to mm -hmm. take that stuff and really wants it gives you that option, but yes. you don't need to put it in if you've bought yeah. the expansion, if your game, if your group doesn't enjoy that. So my number six is Core Worlds, and I haven't admittedly gotten to explore this as much as I would like. I know yeah. it is a huge, uh, you know, it, it's a love of Moe's, and he, I'm sure it's not on his list because he hasn't played it in ages yes. and ages and ages. That's exactly uh, why. But uh, but the play I, plays I have gotten of it really wet my whistle and intrigued me in getting more core worlds to the table. Yeah. For years, core worlds was my favorite deck builder, uh, like easily my favorite deck builder, but it's long. It's it's, it takes a long time to get through. It's, it's a bit of a slog. It's an engine builder. You got to go through eight different levels before you get there. And then final scoring is kind of weird with all the core worlds. And if you're not playing with experienced players, that sometimes becomes a mess. Uh, it was up there, but that one has dropped. And again, a big part is I haven't played it recently. My number five, we just talked a whole bunch about go back to Kickstarter. Adventure, adventure card game wasn't on my list because I hadn't played this in 2018. I adore this. Um, I, I, I am so happy we got this game. This was something that someone reached out to me. Eric Simon got a hold of me and was like, hey, we think you'll love this game. We just want you to talk about it. No obligation. You don't have to even review it, but I think you'll love this game. And Eric, I know through uh, some some shared friends and I played with him at cons and stuff. So he sent this over this massive box of stuff we still haven't even gotten through. And I'm like, Ooh, I hope I like this game. And then we played the duel and I was like, oh, well, this game. <laughs> and then we played the adventure co-op mode. And I, except for the fact it's a little dark, and a little problematic at times in its content. The gameplay, though, is fantastic. Absolutely. My number five is uh, was introduced to me by Mo, but my pleas have actually all been with my kids. And that is Clank, a deck building adventure. 
Uh, this was, you know, one of the big introductions of my kids into my love of deck building that both of them really got into. My son did enjoy DC. Uh, my daughter played it some, but didn't love it. Whereas they both really enjoy playing Clank. Yeah, this one, I, I don't know. It's it's up there for me. I, I could look at my top, whatever I ended up, top 500 list or whatever this <laughs> thing generated. It's in there somewhere. Um, probably in the top hundred, but I haven't been playing this one as much. I, I feel like I need to do is get some expansions to refresh it. I need to get like the monkey temple or something. What I would love to do, and I, I'm kicking myself for not doing it when it was readily available, is not picking up the legacy version. At the time we were playing Gloomhaven and then we were looking at Jaws and then it was the pandemic and it's now out of print and I've heard really good things about it. So I'm kicking myself for not picking up Clank Legacy. Number four, a game people predicted might have been my number one last year. It was actually my number eight last year is the Duke. Um, I I still play it. I, I still bring this out. We had it out at chapter two. Deanna and I still play the Duke. We bring it with us on vacation. One of the best two player board games I've ever played. Chess based, except for the fact the pieces show how they move. And when you move them, how they move will change. Uh, this is this to me is a modern classic. Like, why is there not more Duke coming out? And not Yarl. Yarl, no, is not in my top. It's not even in my top 100. Because they just, they made it too strategic. I like that little bit of randomness. That that little bit of, I pull from the bag. And the fact my Dukes can move all the way across the board in one move. All right, well, my number four is, uh, I swear the last of these, I really, I swear. <laughs> uh, but DC Deck Building, the Teen Titans. Now, I, I'm not even sure if I can explain why uh, it's been a while since I've had it at the table, but there was just something about the play of Teen Titans and the interactions of the cards that made it feel tighter and fresher. Uh, and, and maybe it was because it was a little more narrow than DC, uh, yeah. you know, having that Teen Titans uh, narrow focus but it really made for a fantastic game. And I think if I were to play, if I were to suggest anyone who was interested in DC deck building, go out and buy the Teen Titans pack first and foremost, and, and yep. use that as your decision, whether or not you want to dive in as head first as I have. Now, it could also just be time, right? This one came out significantly after the original, so they would have got feedback from everyone playing online too. Mm. All right, this is the only game that stayed exactly the same for me, which was pretty funny. Uh, that is Shogun. Uh, this is the Japanese retheme of Wallenstein. And times in my life, Wallenstein was ranked higher because I liked how cutthroat it is. But now I preferred the laid back, yes, you can turtle, though you can fail at turtling as well, version of Shogun. Again, Cube Tower, you're... Uh, I already basically described it for every province. You get a card and you pick one of eight things to do in each of your provinces. It's even got some thematic stuff there. Like this province is going to war. Well, this province is going to build a granary and this province is going to raise taxes for you. I, I don't know. i love this game. I always have like ever since playing Wallenstein with Neil, I don't even know how many years ago in German I've been obsessed. Now there is one game and here's where I messed up with Sean <laughs> is I introduced the series to him with immortals. Immortals does not belong on this list. Immortals doesn't belong anywhere near this list. Put it this way, I started this list by ranking my games on Board Game Geek and only looking at the ones I ranked seven or more. Immortals wasn't in that list to even make this list. So yes, I love these Cube Tower games, but get Shogun or get Wallenstein, ignore Immortals. Fair enough. Line number three, Space Base. One we've talked about more than enough, I think, on this show already. Yes. Uh, for you guys to know, our feelings about this great game at so many player counts. That's one of the really yes. amazing things about it is yes. how many player counts it works just as well at. And I will note uh, AG maybe sponsor our giveaway later today, which I probably could have hinted at some other games earlier. <laughs> at Adventure. Yeah. yeah. Space space is fantastic. Didn't make my top 25. I don't even know why. Like I said, we used board game ranking engine. When I sit and think about it, I feel it should be in my top 25, but it didn't come up. I don't know what I ranked higher. All right, my number two game of all time, and this actually I feel comfortable even saying of all time, is Eclipse, Second Dawn for the Galaxy, old rank 28 or 38. The reason it was ranked 38 is I didn't have any expansions. I didn't have specifically the Ancients expansion that actually puts different Ancients on the different planets and little ships there. 
or the one that gives asymmetric ships. I know it's just a physical upgrade, but the fact our forces look different makes the game better. And then there's the improvements with Second Dawn, the refigured tech deck, um, missiles that are no longer broken. They fix the rules for missiles compared to the old edition. You no longer win by just putting as many orange dice as possible on your ships, at least in battle. Uh, and the upgrades, like just even the M, whatever MDSC, I can't remember what it's called. The thing in the center of the board is one of the coolest miniatures I own. Throwing that out, I just second on, took a game I love and just made it better. There we go. My number two is the Duke. Uh, and again, this one comes back to family. Me and my son sitting down playing the Duke before school, after school, on the weekends. It's just a great game yep. that really fits with a whole lot of different people and play styles. Uh, you can't go wrong with the Duke, folks. All right, number one. This took longer than I thought it would. We're talking <laughs> more than I thought. Number one for me is Anachrony, the Infinity Box version. Again, it jumped up 10 ranks, mainly because of the new edition. Plus, I've now actually explored some of the expansion content, though still not all of it, which is ridiculous that I haven't done this. I There's just, that game is so good. Like, like the waking up your people, the having to put them in mech suits, the getting resources from the future and having to pay them back, the various asymmetric factions, the fact that I have a book this thick that just lore on this post-apocalyptic world. I, I, Anachrony, just the, every time I play it, I'm like, I need to play more of this. Every time I play it, I swear it goes up. Well, now <laughs> it's at the top, so it can't go any further. Fair enough. And my number one is one that hasn't been played enough. Uh, I want to get it to the table more, although I fear if I do, it might actually get replaced by some of the other fantastic sci fi games out there. Yeah. And that's Pulsar 2849. Uh, this one was such a, a great introduction to meaty, meteor, heavyweight. Yeah sci-fi games uh and it hooked me because of that um and there's probably a little bit of that bias that's gotten this hey. into number one but it is where it is hey if your first experience playing games fantastic it totally deserves it. yeah all right i'm gonna quickly go through this because again this took longer than i thought just these are the games that dropped off my list and where they ended up and why i think so. number one is azul from two to 96 that's a huge drop but anymore, like Azul is still a great welcoming game. I still want to bring it to events. I still want to teach new people. I have very little interest in sitting down and playing Azul. But to me, that Azul is my new splendor. I played so much of it, so many games. I have no interest in just sitting down and playing Azul. Obviously, Sean still really digs it. The biggest drop, Race for the Galaxy, probably because I have played over 150 games on Board Game Arena. I used to adore Race for the Galaxy. I still like it. But now I just feel like I've seen the game played out. I've seen every possible card combination. I've, I've done it all in that game, it feels like. And I'm actually kind of glad eventually I didn't get invited to another game of Race for the Galaxy. That dropped from 5 to 45. Plank, a deck building adventure, 6 to 64. Way bigger drop than I thought. But you know what? When I'm sitting there going, I want to play a deck builder, it just it's not even on my list. Like I don't even think, oh, let's grab Clank. Again, I think part of it is I have played my copy a lot, and all I have is the, the first expansion with the, the water. I can't even remember what's called the underwater expansion. I think for me, Clank just needs a refresh. I just need something to make it new and interesting again. Bruges, 12 to 55. Just shows what I was playing at the time period. Um, I dig Bruges, but Bruges is not easy to teach, and we just haven't been playing it because I don't like teaching it. This is one of those ones that could easily bump back up, if, hey, excuse me, if, say, I bring it out to the barbershop bar and we play and people like bring out Bruges again and I play it a few more times in a row. Onitama, the biggest drop, 13 to 179. It was neat. It's cool what it does. I'd just rather play the Duke. Like, it, it's, it's, it's a two-player only game. If I'm going to grab a two-player game that I'm going to throw in the glove box and bring with us on vacation or down to the beach, it's going to be the Duke over Onitama. Agizia, for years, my biggest hidden gem, the game everyone who came over is like, oh, what's something interesting? I played Agizia with them. Was 14, now down to 68. The charm finally wore off, and I think it just got dated. It's, it's an old school Euro with a worker placement to choose what actions you're going to take, set collection, card collection, tableau building, spending resources to build monuments. It just it feels like an older game. It's got the Catan problem. It just feels a little dated. Next, I have Hamster Roll, 
dropped from 16 to 44. It's still good, but I think mainly it was just the fact of, I, you know what? It's a dexterity game. It's fun. It's a really good dexterity game. But going through the list, every time it came compared to a game, I was like, I'd rather play a game than play this silly ham. Uh, Pitch Car also dropped uh, from 17 to 28. So it's this close to being on my top 25. Pitch Car is just so much fun for big groups. And I love how they have tons of the tracks setting them up. Uh, Concept, the another huge drop, 18 to 107. I, I The joy of this game is just slowly slipping. I think mainly because I haven't been in situations I want to play it. Possibly because we haven't done an extra life all night gaming event in three years. That could be why. Uh, Power Grid. The first time ever I did a board game ranking list, it was a num- my number one, um, particularly the deluxe edition from 19 to 36. I still dig it, but it's not getting plays. On to Teutonica, there was a point there I was playing it like crazy, uh, quite a bit. Sorry, Bonkers, playing it Bonkers. Uh, 20 to 80, big drop just because I'm not playing it. And again, that's one that I bet you if I start playing it and I redid this list next year, it would bump back up. Zongwo. 21 to 111 as it ends up. I was playing extreme for most of the games I played. Opaque game, not easy to teach and hard to get to the table. You need your heavy gamers to play this one. Gloomhaven, I think this is a sign of the times. In 2018, we were live streaming it. Now we haven't played it since COVID. From 22 to 50. And I will say some of the brilliance has worn off on that game, especially once it went from being extremely difficult to extremely easy. Food Chain Magnet, 24 to 49. Again, big meaty games that aren't getting played, which also fits for Dungeon Lords Happy Anniversary Edition 25 to 37. Some of our overlaps, uh, for those who wanted to keep track, The Duke, Orléans, Aventuria, Anachrony, Eclipse, Dawn of the Second Galaxy, Scythe, and Zaya were all overlaps on our list. Which is actually not much for the fact that almost every game you played, you played with me. Absolutely, yep. But there you have, it, folks, our top 25 games of right now. So I was shocked by how many on my list changed in the last three years and 200 episodes. I'm really looking forward to doing this again. Maybe we'll make it an every 100 episodes thing. Maybe we'll do it again for episode 300 and see if Sean's list changes as much as I did. Yeah, I'm very interested to see what, in my, what happens to mine over time now that I have that baseline uh, original set to work with. Now, remember, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. Consider us a dear Abby for tabletop gamers. Get your questions to us by clicking on Ask the Bellhop at tabletopbellhop.com, emailing questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or hitting me up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. All right, it's time for the big one. It's time to officially announce our largest tabletop game giveaway ever. Hopefully not our largest ever going forward, but for now, definitely our biggest. So in preparation for tonight's episodes, uh, thanks to Deanna's help, I reached out to a bunch of board game publishers, specifically publishers we worked with in the past, uh, publishers where we've reviewed games of theirs or shared games or worked with them, and asked them if they'd be willing to help us celebrate this momentous arbitrary milestone. I provided each of them with a list of their games we covered in the past and asked that they'd be willing to help us out by providing a giveaway copy for one of those games. We were, I think it's safe to say, shocked by just how many publishers jumped at a chance to take part. Yes. Most of which did step up and provide a game or games that we've talked about sometime over the last 199.5 episodes. Now, before we get to the massive list, let's first talk a bit about how to enter. So. We're not ready to launch this one tonight. If you're listening, though, you are good. This giveaway is going to launch on Tuesday, March the, I had this wrong, 14th in the notes. Tuesday, March the 14th at 2 a.m. Eastern. This is the exact time this podcast will drop everywhere. Now, you will need to head to tabletopbellhop.com and click on the pinned post. There, you will find a page explaining the contest and everything we are giving away as well as links to our coverage of the matching games. Now, at the bottom of the page will be some type of giveaway widget where you will sign in with your email or log in via Google, Facebook, whatever whatever widget Deanna's using, because we're actually looking at a few different ones that we're, we're potentially, as this is so big, going to buy a piece of raffle software to use going forward. Um, so we can do things like daily entry bonuses. 
then you can just start clicking on the entries. Now, what we highly encourage you to do is please support these awesome sponsors by clicking on each of their links. Not even just to get extra entries in there, but just to thank these companies for stepping up. We provided each sponsor one link to whatever they wanted. Their homepage, Instagram account, online store, whatever. Please show thanks for their support with this giveaway by visiting all of them. Now, there'll also be bonus entries for the normal things. I right? subscribe to the Tabletop Bellhop Weekly Newsletter and a spot for our hotel guest or better Patreon patrons to enter their code for five bonus entries. Okay, I think everyone has probably entered an online contest before, so let's get to what the people really want to hear. What's up for grabs? And I have been trying to find an AI version of Mo, but uh, unfortunately, we can't quite afford that yet. So oh. if you want an AI version of Mo, think about joining our Patreon. There you go. And maybe we can get a fake we Mo. We can get chat MOE. All right. For the most part, these games are going to be available for people in the continental U.S. and Canada. We ask publishers, U.S. and Canada, please. Now, there are some exceptions and some games that will be available worldwide. Due to this variety, I encourage anyone to enter, and then we'll do our best to match you up with something that's available in your area. Also note, prizes are going to be awarded randomly. Unlike our door prizes tonight, we're not going to let people pick a game. That'd just be way too difficult to manage. What's getting what and who's going where and, and who's shipping what to who. So this is going to be random. Finally, some prizes may be awarded before the contest comes to a close. So make sure you get in on day one. One publisher in particular is offering up a game a day for the entire length of this contest, which is going to run for three weeks. So let's start off with Unidragon. Now we've reviewed Quezzle from them, as well as the king-sized Majestic Wolf puzzle. They are offering any puzzle of your choice up to king size. Next, we have Ulysses Spiel, who are offering up a copy of my number five game of all time, Sean's number seven, the Adventuria Adventure card game. Here's a chance for those of you who have been complaining they can't find a copy of this game to get one of their own. All right, well, moving back over to puzzles, Escape Welt is offering up one copy of the Fort Knox box, which we felt really was the better of the two escape boxes that they sent us to review. And we have more Escape Welt reviews coming. So i got one sitting right on my desk right now. Now, here's one for the role-playing game fans. Yet again, to prove we are a tabletop gaming podcast and not a board game podcast. This is an awesome one. One of the best RPGs I've ever read. Really Publishing has joined the Fellowship and is offering up a physical copy of the One Ring Bundle. This includes the core hardcover core rulebook, the starter set, one of the best box starter sets I've ever played, the Lore Master Screen and Rivendell Compendium. In addition to this, also available worldwide, are three digital copies of the game as well that will be fulfilled through Drive Through RPG. Now, next up, we've got Good Games Publishing, who is offering up two games we really enjoyed. First, Land vs. Sea, and the second being Guildmaster. I do apologize we couldn't offer up a copy of Unfair. I wanted to, but they are actually between printings right now. These games are still really good, but I will say Unfair is my favorite by them. Next, we have Mark Spector of Grand Gamers Guild, longtime fan of the show, and I've got to say one of our best advocates. Mark is a board game publisher who is a fan and always is quick to point out that we deserve more attention than we get. So thank you for that, Mark. Also, I got to thank Mark for inspiring me to even reach out because he reached out to us first before anyone else to offer to support us. He is offering up two games from their Holiday Hijinks series. We're going to have two different winners who will get to pick which game they want. This is between any of the Holiday Hijinks being Groundhog Gambit, The Birthday Burglary, The Cupid Crisis, The Pumpkin Problem, The Independence Incident, and The Kringle Caper. And I got to thank Mark for updating it because originally it was going to be the Groundhog Gambit and the Cupid Crisis because we we're going to launch this in early February. But he's like, you know what? This way they can get a game for the holiday they enjoy most. There we go. Next up, Hidden Industries. The company behind Hidden Games is going over the top with their contribution. They're offering up one game per day 
for yeah. the entire length of our giveaway. Yes. That's 21 games total, including seven copies of the Maple Brook case, seven copies of the New Haven case, and seven copies of the Midnight Crown. Note the Midnight Crown is technically a part two, but all of these work standalone. The Maple Brook and New Haven case are actually kind of the same product. One localized to Canada, one localized to the U.S., but playable in both countries. Next, we have Puzzling Pursuits, who's offering up a copy of Black Brim 1876, an escape room in a box my extended family loved. Now, technically, the winner can actually pick a game of their choice from them, though we recommend Black Spin Brim in particular because we reviewed it and it was great. Now, the op is offering up a game we've been playing but haven't quite played enough to review yet, and that's Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances, the board game version of the mobile hit. Yes. Now, they have donated the core set and the first two expansions. And I'm trying to squeeze them for the third expansion as well. We'll see how that works. Again, that didn't even announce when we were first going to launch this. Next, we get to AEG, Alteric Entertainment Group, who is offering up two fantastic games, games we talked about a lot on this show. That is Space Base and the fantastic Point Salad. And next, we have Rebel Studios. That's got a big Chronicles of Avel package. For one lucky winner anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. Note that. That one, this one is anywhere in the world. The package includes the Chronicles of Avel base game, the Adventures Toolkit, and the Meeple stickers. And finally, we've got Japanime Games, who is offering up a game that surprised both of us and was on our best games of 2022 list and made my top 25 games of all time with Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade. I'm so glad they're offering this so someone else can discover this great game. Now, in addition to this, they loved our tasteful coverage of Tante Koro because we didn't take the game and just make fun of the art. So they're actually offering up a copy of this one as well. This is a Japanese made themed deck building game that is actually really solid. Now, wow, that is like, a lot of games. We really weren't kidding when we were talking no about how big this was and how impressive the support from all of these publishers has been. Yeah, I know. This, this is ridiculous. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to give another round of thanks to all of our awesome sponsors. Unidragon, Ulysses Spiel, Escape Welt, Free League, Good Games Publishing, Grand Gamers Guild, Hidden Games, Japanime Games, Puzzling Pursuit, The Op, Rebel Studio and AEG. That is 12 fantastic, awesome publishers. You all rock, and I look forward to working with the rest of you over our next 200 episodes. Well, that takes care of all the stuff we wanted to cover this episode. Now it's time to sit back and relax and hang out with the awesome folk in the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. So let me start by thanking all of you who are still here and who are here tonight. It does mean a lot to see folks come out and watch us record, especially because we know we run pretty late some nights, including tonight. Yes. <laughs> now, not everyone works from home and has a flexible life the way we are supremely lucky to. Yes, thank you very much. I also want to thank you all for the support you've shown us, not just by showing up for our live shows, but the people listening at home, the people who interact and comment on our content, the lurkers who download our podcast every week and listen to it on their commute by sharing our content with our gaming fans, by people telling other people about our show, and just being part of the awesome tabletop gaming community. While I love our community, I love every gamer who's out there, everyone who's out there spreading the love of gaming, playing games with friends and family around tables together. Absolutely. And I, we said this earlier on during the coffee breaks, but this, so that everyone hears it, we deeply appreciate all of our fans, whether they're here live or not, because without you, this show wouldn't exist. No, we wouldn't sit here just talking to uh, talking amongst ourselves uh, and, and, and doing something dry without the interaction and without the yes. feedback and, and, and repertoire we have with our fans, both live and across social media. Yes. So thank you. Thank you for that. All right. Do we have anything that the 
chat has been kind of talking with us around the whole thing, answering our trivia questions, which was fantastic. Anything the chat wants to talk about uh, before we go on. The other thing is, do we want to make a decision right now, live on the air, to record next week at 8? Uh, I think we should probably do one more at 9 and then move to 8. One more at 9? Already, yeah, just to... There you go. Roger Todger yeah. Games. You two got me into the hobby. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. I still remember running into Roger at CG Realm and him very excitedly showing me one of his game designs, um, doing the thing game designers do, thinking it's a totally unique new thing no one's seen before without realizing the breadth and width of the, the tabletop gaming industry and the number of games that are out there. And yes, he still had a great concept. I'm not trying to shoot Roger <laughs> down here. But it's just someone who 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 I grew up in in their bubble, not knowing what was out there, and being able to open the, pop that bubble and show Roger, look at these games. And I I I hope and I think this that we've helped expand Roger's repertoire in a good way to make his games better than they ever would have been without. Yeah, and uh, and and just talking about the board game market, it has just recently come out in the news that the market is still exploding yes. and the mar the growth rate of board games right now is ridiculous with mm -hmm. the mark uh, with the the total uh market value looking at yes. 30 almost 31 billion dollars that's billion with a b by 2028 with rpgs i think growing even more if not well i don't know maybe it's shrinking for a bit now because of some yeah. RPG, bs that was going on yeah. recently <laughs> I just try, but we're not just board games here. <laughs> we need to get role playing again so that we really can, like every third episode, talk about a role playing game, yeah. or at least talk it in the, in the bellhops tabletop of what we played. I have so many single session stuff I want to run. Yep. No, absolutely. Yeah. So people are happy with eight. So I am. I'm seriously. We'll announce it next week if it's official. We'll we'll switch to an eight o'clock recording, or even eight thirty. But I'm thinking eight's probably better. Well, I mean, again, we'll we'll start at eight, and we'll actually yeah, yeah. start recording at eight fifteen or eight twenty. See, 8 we didn't start until about nine twenty. We're like two hours in at this point with the coffee break, so yeah. I'm not sure how long we're going to keep this going with the chat. I expected to spend more time hanging out with people, but we interacted with you a lot during the show, Absolutely. actually more than I actually expected to. And life lesson, lear lesson learned: having Sean and Mo talk about twenty five games each unscripted takes a long time. Yeah, <laughs> next next time it's got to be a, a a more you know bullet point list, less game descriptions. Because yeah, this, well, uh, especially because I, I I admit it was my fault. I was talking about each of them because if Sean talked about, it, I'm like, I want to share my thoughts on that game too. Yeah. So I do apologize for that. Um, that or we just cut it down to twenty or something more reasonable. Or if that's the whole episode, <laughs> we yeah. don't try to squeeze other things in. And Pax enjoyed it anyway. So we yeah, there you go. It was a great video. segment. I I think it was a worthwhile segment. I like talking about games I'm excited about, and I like like that's that is the the joy. And yes, yeah, so, oh good. So Pax did enjoy hearing how things change. That's what kind of blew me away. I wanted to look at the old list and the new list. Thankfully, I'm fairly proficient at Excel, so I actually used <laughs> a a set of recurring V lookups to be able to see where all my lists were at. And technically, they're all on my uh, Excel file we use for people's comments and stuff like that. Yeah, I've got to make sure I don't lose track lose track of my uh I'll throw my them list. on the same thing. Like the spreadsheets on the drive, just go into the spreadsheet and throw your list up. Right. So what was I okay, what was the worst game I ranked at least seven is what I'm curious about. And I swear it it pulled games I did not rank seven. <laughs> I don't I thought I had that tab up. I don't have that tab up anymore. Yeah, and, and I have to say I I did do some editing in my list. There are certain games that we don't talk about anymore that probably yes. would have made this list yep. but i refuse to discuss yes so, I, I, um, the same thing here the the lowest game on my list so i actually ended up with 154 games uh yep. on my ranking the lowest rank is clue harry potter edition uh which we have talked about in the past and i, I mean honestly this doesn't even count as a game to me it, it i mean it ranks I, I think it should probably rank like a two or a three if i was actually scoring it on board game geek uh, interestingly, Immortals is 153. There we go. <laughs> so, I told you, Immortals. The only game... I said the problem is I taught I taught him Immortals, and then I'm like, no, no, now I got to show you Shogun, and Immortals I messed that up. So bad, it but was Immortals just... was so bad that he was just like, Awful. I think Shogun. He's like, no, this is too similar to Immortals. Oh, I, 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 it's really hard to explain how bad of a game Immortals was. Oh, here's something else. Sorry, I want to do. 
We already called out again uh, the the Ulysses Field um, Kickstarter. Deanna's asking, where did you uh, rank? Hellbringer? Hellbringer was forty five. I didn't. It was it was down a little bit. Um, and I, you know what? I'm not even sure why. Again, this the there's so much momentary feels for where that. Uh, uh, yeah, I know my game of the year, and it didn't even rate. I know, but it was you know what? It was just one of those games where, as I was thinking about the. You know, when I was ranking things, how I felt about that game at that moment and what it was up yep. against. Uh, it's it's the the intricacies of how that ranking system works. Uh, I know and Mo I gotta had admit, some, it's hard. Because it's literally, here's moments. two games picked. Yeah. And I'm like, I had Go Cuckoo versus, what was it? It was like one of my number one games. And I'm like, how do I rank this? Yeah. So I am dropping a link to the Hellbringer. Um, I, I feel like we're cutting it up by saying this, but I ranked it 150. But 150 out of over a thousand games, more than that, I own a thousand games. I've probably played 2,000 or 3,000 games. 150 is really dang good. I think and Hellbringer, one of the things with Hellbringer is, is that it tends to be a better solo experience. Yes. And that, I think, is one of the major reasons it did get knocked down um, because it was, it really was a fantastic solo game. But I don't solo game all that much. So, yes, again, you know, given given the opportunity to play, you know, something with someone or a fantastic solo mm -hmm. game, odds are I'm usually going to lean towards the better group experience because board gaming to me is a social experience. Totally fair. So my lowest ranked game was Gloria Mundi, which was absolutely terrible. Um, we got it for five bucks or 10 bucks or something at a discount place. And it was all about following the path Alexander followed. And you have to found Alexandria over and over and over again, because dude had an ego to rival ego. Um, <laughs> his head was as big as a planet when every city gets named after you. It was terrible. Like, like I, I, Deanna remembers this one. It had cheap ass components. Like it just had like the cheapest pawns. And it didn't feel like you had any good choices. It just, it was bad. So, yes, I know we like to talk about the games we love, but Gloria Mundi was my lowest ranked games. And because people dig it, I know we don't like the bad talk games, but you know what? It's our 200th episode. I'm going to give everyone my, 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 my 10 worst games that, that, uh, that I ranked pretty high. <laughs> so, no, I ranked these higher than other stuff. Like, I don't know how Board Game Geek pulled these. Now, it's not even worth it because, like, there's so much stuff that's ranked below this that... That isn't on the list because of how I did it. No, it doesn't really work. Like when I'm looking at this, I'm like, no, that game's not terrible. So, I mean, just like, as a quick sample for me, like my, the next five games, the five games that almost made the list for me, Rallyman GT, which I was so, yep. sor so sad to hear the publisher has, uh, has gone under. Yeah, they've gone under, uh, smash up Disney edition. Um, uh, Scott Pilgrim's precious little card game chiseled and Jaipur. Those are all good games. Uh, yeah. I mean, like Scott Pilgrim's was a really fantastic game for people who love Scott Pilgrim. Uh, and the it was, combo and it mechanic some, was yeah, so neat, but really I'm interesting not... mechanic. But you had to really appreciate Scott Pilgrim to get it. Yep. And and that's not everyone likes that. So, uh, meet my next. Uh, let's get up to thirty. Robo Rally, Quacks of Quedlinburg, which I was surprised wasn't higher. Pitch Car, Veen Host Deluxe, Unfair, Core Worlds. Oh, I went too far. <laughs> that was 31. Yeah. Imperial Assault, but wait, there's more. That's what it was. It was but wait, there's more versus like Orleans. Yeah, that was that and was I'm a like, brutal. man, that's like the best party game ever. <laughs> like the ultimate pitching improv game. And and Orleans, like favorite deck, like the bag builder, one of my favorite games. I'm like, I don't know how to rank this. Yeah, that was that was nasty. That, that was just kind of one of those cruel uh uh moments of fate. Yes, I, 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 Deanna saying Gloria Mundi, hard stop, no. <laughs> yes, apples versus oranges. And that's the problem with ranking board games. Uh, so many board games are apples versus oranges. Uh, you know, how do you, how do you compare Go Cuckoo and Don, uh, you know, say Escape for the Escape for the Galaxy or, you know, Horizons or, you know, how do, how do you how do you compare yeah. those? But like I said, what, what I, my general criteria when I'm using board game rankings is what do I want to out of these two games? If I had a group right now, Tori and Kat are coming over, which of those two games would I go downstairs and play? The problem is I didn't rank all the games in one day. Now, now Ry Roger asked, how many choices did I have to make? I think it was 13,000. It was up there. 
and like originally it was ridiculous like 70,000 or something stupid so I I that's why I cut it to cut off at ranked 7 or higher games I ranked 7 or higher I probably could have cut it off at games I ranked 8 or higher I was worried I wouldn't get 100 cuz originally I was going to do my top 100 games and I'm like that's nah, too many um but the thing is it's really quick when it's quick like you can use arrow keys left and right so you can literally be there going left 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 right left right right left left right right oop up which backs up so you can do it pretty quick, but then you have to sometimes stop. Now, Ryan's asking if the Hellbringer relaunch looks like a better. Yes. Oh, uh, 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 better co-op. That I don't know. I don't remember noticing any improvements on the multiplayer. Um, there were improvements on the packaging. Uh, the expansions have me excited. I don't know if Sean's looked at it, but the stuff he's now offering. Yeah. There's, there's more boards and stuff, but totally failing on the fact that he's going with non-rectangular boards. And it's just one of those things I know because I worked in the auto industry and I had to get various tags that you put on racks cut. And by adding one little burb like this, added $10,000 to the cost of these tags because they could no longer use a standard die to cut them. They had to take an existing die and machine it to put that little tab. Now we're auto industry. We could afford the difference in price, but like the price difference was that dramatic. And he keeps putting out these boards with like little bits sticking out here and a little bit here. Now the bottom player boards are rounded on the bottom, which looks nicer, but there's no reason. Like just, I, I don't know. I, I don't know the manufacturer they're using, but like I look at that as someone who has had paper products created and cardboard products created and has dealt with packaging. And I'm looking at that going, but then it won't fit in a standard mold. There is a reason books all tend to come in the same size. There's a reason there's eight and a half by 11 and a four and people use those. And it's all because of the dies that already exist. If you can reuse someone else's die, if stronghold games work with uh, penguin games to publish terraforming Mars and they have a die to cut a specific size. If you could use that instead of them having to cut a new one, you save a fortune. And that's where I, I think they're still falling down a bit. Yeah. No, absolutely. Now the price is way better. The price points better now which is good, but I still feel it could have been lower. Yeah. And I, and I mean, I, I, I would be in there on, on the uh, things I'm, I'm not spending right now, but uh, I would definitely be in there on the, uh, with, with yeah. the expansions. Um, because I think it's, I think they really did go, go out there with the expansions and improve things. Yeah. The expansions do look definitely, it, it looks good. I honestly, I'd be tempted. Um, here, I'll be purely honest. I am hoping to get to review a production copy so we can help him sell copies when it comes out. So that's one reason I did not back that one. The one last thing before we sign out for the night. While we appreciate everyone who tunes in, listens, and interacts with our content, a special thanks goes out to our Patreon patrons, our VIP guests, because without them, this show probably wouldn't have made it to 200 episodes. Tonight, and since... Tonight, since it is our 200th episode, we're going to go through the full list. Starting with William Fisher, thank you. Danielle and Owen Thomas, thanks to both of you. Sean P. Kelly, thank you, Sean. Derek Hisson, thanks, Derek. Andrew Dacey, thank you, Andrew. Brian Van Beek, thank you, Brian. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. The Misdirected Mark Podcast, a show that's been going much longer than we have. We can only hope we last as long. Dukas, thank you. Evil John, thank you, John. Donna, thank you, Pax. Valentine Peach, thank you. Brian Sheehan, thank you, Brian. Ron F., thank you, Ron. Roger Malosh, thanks, Roger Dodge. David Miller Jr., thank you. Brian Kurtz, our first ever Patreon patron, the person who gave me the ego boost before we went live. Thank you, Brian. Jeff, Sheila, and Clara Seuss, I know you're off to bed already, but thank you. Pat and Tori, hope to see you in two days. Dean Graham, thank you, Dean. Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at TabletopBellhop.com. All over the web is TabletopBellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice. After you go, be sure to stop by Patreon.com slash TabletopBellhop and tip your bellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us for this special 200th episode celebration. With another 200 more to come, at least. 
for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.